From business closures to job losses, the COVID-19 pandemic has hit our economy hard. Some families, especially low-income households, have difficulty meeting their daily expenses, even as the government has pledged close to $100 billion in various support measures. Hello, I'm Diana Sir. Welcome to this special episode of In Conversation. Today, I'm with Minister of Social and Family Development and Second Minister for National Development, Desmond Lee. Welcome, Minister. Thank you, Diana, for having me. Minister, you're also co-chair of the Emerging Stronger Task Force. What is the most pressing matter for the task force right now? Well, even as the multi-ministry task force works hard at reopening uh, society and economy, uh, we need to keep an eye on the global shifts that are happening around the world and in the region uh, that will impact Singapore. But we must make sure that we keep our eye on the road ahead because the road ahead will have many twists and turns and the uh, impact of the pandemic is still unfolding as we speak. So it's important for the task force uh, to identify what are the shifts that are taking place, uh, the impact that it will have on Singapore and Singaporeans. Some of the impact is felt immediately. Some of it will be felt in the mid to long term. And unless we position ourselves well, uh, help our businesses to adapt and adjust quickly and enable Singaporeans to pick up the necessary skills and make the adjustments, uh, we will be buffeted uh, for quite some time yet. The public health uh, threat posed by COVID-19 is severe but uh, you're beginning to see a uh, very uh, significant economic fallout, both in Singapore and around the world, and that uh, will have a very long tail. So the uh, task force is uh, working very quickly to uh, identify with the Future Economy Council what is happening in each of the sectors of our economy, uh, what are the risks and threats, and uh, more importantly, what are the opportunities that are out there? Uh, because you cannot just identify an, an opportunity and expect that people will go seize it. We have to facilitate, we have to enable. There's a partnership between the government, the private sector, uh, our unions and our workers, as well as our, our institutes of higher learning, to be able to move quickly, to move nimbly, to move as a whole ecosystem in order to seize those opportunities. For the benefit of some of us, what exactly does systemic shift mean? And Okay, have you already identified one? Yeah, so if you look at what's happening uh, to economies because of the pandemic, uh, there is a, a real threat to globalization. Uh, because of the uh, public health threat that is exposed, countries have closed borders, restricting the movement of people as well as of goods. Uh, supply chains have been disrupted. Uh, countries find that they have difficulty getting uh, the goods that they need, even essential supplies. Uh, and so there is that shift towards nearshoring or inshoring, trying to bring as much of your production and supply chain. Self-reliance Self to, to some extent, but uh, relying less on partnerships with other countries and the rest of the world. So you will see a bit more of that, in fact a lot of that, countries seeking to bring their supply chains home, their production bases home, uh, to operate more regionally. On the other hand, you see other countries, including Singapore, uh, tackling these uh, resiliency issues by further diversification. And so partnering like-minded countries and economies, uh, identifying where the vulnerabilities are, ensuring that we spread out our production bases, strengthen our supply chains, diversify them, uh, whether it's food, whether it is uh, components, whether it is uh, end products. Uh, because, you know, in Singapore, we can't produce everything. What on earth does that mean for Singapore? Because we rely on the rest of the world even for our food. Yes, indeed. So, uh, Singapore has thrived thus far because we have uh, reaped the fruits of globalization. People being more open, people uh, leveraging and arbitra arbitraging on, uh, on uh, comparative advantages. Uh, working together, uh, but if countries decide that uh, you know, they want to shorten their supply chains, rely less on partners and on, on others and wanting to bring everything into their country, then certainly we have to make sure that we respond to that. 
we have to rely on our reputation, on our good uh, governance and legal system, on our connectivity, uh, on our ability to uh, connect with both the East and West, North and South, uh, so that we continue to be part of supply chains and value chains, uh, no matter what these shifts are. Uh, but having said that, we also need to build internal resilience. And you just talked about food resilience. We launched the uh, Gardening with Edibles uh, movement in Singapore. It's got overwhelming uh, support of Singaporeans. Over 100,000 people responded in a day, asking for seed packs uh, in a bit to grow edibles at home. And this is really part and parcel of uh, uh, our bigger push towards food resilience, food supply resilience. And even before the uh, pandemic struck us, we launched the Singapore Story, uh, trying to push for a 30 by 30 movement, grow 30% of our nutritional needs in Singapore, uh, in under 10 years, by 2030. And uh, this sense that uh, even as we rely on the rest of the world for our food, we also want to have some assurance that we can grow some of our food internally in Singapore. So that is really symptomatic of the kind of uh, resiliency thinking that we must undergo to be able to build internal resilience, but also look at our supply chains, look at our place in the world, uh, whether we are an intermediary, whether we are part of an ecosystem, being able to remain relevant, being able to add value to countries and to corporations who are really looking as a result of COVID-19, uh, the whole idea uh, that the world is an oyster. Well, I, this, this uh, embracing the challenges and meeting them head on, like someone says, uh, never waste a crisis, isn't it? Yes, indeed. <laughs> Okay, we don't I want a crisis, but uh, since it's upon us, we must make sure that we, we uh, go into forward gear, uh, be on top of it, and try to seize whatever opportunities come our way. And that's a very essential mindset to take. Not just passively uh, responding, but proactively trying to seize the opportunities that come along our way. How did the government decide on the members of the task force? It is part of the Future Economy Council, uh, which uh, comprises uh, a broad and diverse range of industries, both MNCs as well as SMEs. We also have uh, uh, government agencies, we have the labour movement, and we have academics. Uh, so you look at the Emerging Stronger Task Force diversity in the context of the broader Future Economy Council to which it reports. And you begin to see that in the work of the Future Economy Council, the strands of Singapore together run through it, the idea of partnerships. It's not just government, but government partnering with industry, partnering with uh, the academics, partnering with the labour movement. But you know that uh, in Singapore, it's both social economic issues that drive us. And on the social front, there are also uh, partnerships through the Singapore Together movement. And so on the uh, emerging stronger side of the house, I co-chair uh, the task force with uh, uh, Mr. Tan Chong Ming, a group CEO of PSA. And on the Singapore Together side, I co-chair uh, with uh, Minister Indrani Raja. And the Singapore Together movement is a year in the making. And in fact, we are about to mark uh, the first year milestone of this uh, uh, governance approach of the government working in partnership with the people and the stakeholders. And uh, the DPM uh, just announced uh, that uh, the Singapore Together uh, uh, movement, as well as the Emerging Stronger Task Force, will be organising a series of Emerging Stronger Conversations, whether it's on the social side or the economic side, to allow us to reach out to the whole spectrum of society, people who are interested in economic issues, both uh, external as well as internal, uh, people who are concerned about social issues, uh, in, about inequality, about the digital connectivity and the digital divide, uh, about the uh, opportunities that lower income households uh, uh, need to, to be given. What I'm hearing is that the government will provide opportunities uh, for whether it's civil society or individuals to provide feedback. In what form will this engagement take? Yes, so both the Singapore Together movement, which focuses on social issues, and the Emerging Stronger Task Force, which focuses on economic issues, uh, need to work very closely together. Uh, for the purposes of being nimble and being focused, they're kept separate. But in fact, they're interlinked. 
And so in order to reach out to Singaporeans who are concerned about social economic issues, we have an emerging stronger conversation, which will be just we shall be both open to all, but also specific in the topics that we want to explore. But conversations have to lead to action. And really, in order for Singapore to emerge stronger from this crisis, we need to be able to uh, partner Singaporeans, identify the gaps, and then seize the opportunity. So let me explain. Under the Emerging Stronger Task Force, we have alliances for action. Because it's one thing to have conversations, but we want to move quickly into the action phase to make sure that we are able to take action to seize these opportunities for Singaporeans and for our enterprises. So alliances for action include alliances uh, around built environment and digitization, uh, for example, around e-commerce, uh, around supply chain resiliency, and these will involve uh, emerging stronger task force members together with many partners who come together to work on three-month sprints. We'll give more details in August, but uh, the alliances are beginning to uh, drive into positive gear, and uh, it will be industry-led and supported by the government. There are comments that the composition of the 15-member task force reflect a more traditional economy that Singapore is used to. Do you think that's fair? So the uh, uh, Emerging Stronger Task Force comprises uh, leaders of industry, but who have an understanding of what's happening to the economy at this point in time, but able to look forward and most importantly, galvanize to action. And so the diversity that we want to reap uh, from this whole enterprise comes from both the conversations that we're going to have uh, across the whole spectrum of society and the economy, but importantly, by partnerships in our alliances for action on the economic side, as well as the Singapore Together Action Networks on the social side. Now, I think it's a false dichotomy to talk about the economic and social aspects of society as polar ends, but in reality, a lot of things that impact Singaporeans are social economic in nature. And therefore, there will be some of these action networks or alliances for action that are social economic in nature. Let me give you one example. Uh, during the circuit breaker, uh, people had to work from home. And uh, what is the traditional divide between home and the office has been blurred. And uh, in a sense, the circuit breaker has forced Singapore uh, to embrace uh, the home as the office for many people who could do so. And that created stresses and strains, but it also created opportunities for us to examine the whole idea uh, of the workplace. And so you had the home being not just the place for family and caregiving, but also the office where you work and interact with your colleagues and clients through digital technology, uh, but also a classroom for home-based learning where parents are required to participate a lot more actively in the virtual classroom with their children and with their teachers. So that is not just economic, but it's also social. And uh, these are uh, in a way, opportunities that will force us to look at and re-examine the whole idea of work-life balance and what working from home represents uh, in the post-COVID world. Minister, let's take a short break now, but when we come back, let's continue the conversation about the Emerging Stronger Task Force. Welcome back. We're in conversation with Minister Desmond Lee. Minister, we were talking about the Emerging Stronger Task Force before the break. You have three very young children. What do you think the future will look like for them in 10, 20 years' time? Well, certainly uh, they will need to embrace a new set of skills in order to navigate uh, the future that is before them. What sort of skills? Number one, they have to be very adroit with digital technology. And in fact, young children are just fish in water. And so I think my children, like many other children in Singapore, will have to be able to operate seamlessly uh, on digital platforms, uh, to be able to uh, nevertheless uh, uh, be high touch, but also uh, highly connected, if I, if I, if I may explain. 
uh, being able to operate on digital platforms allows them to uh, seize opportunities uh, like never before. Being able to access learning and training online and in places around the world. And yet at the same time, uh, we must never replace human connections and human emotions uh, with uh, digital connections. And so being able to connect with people uh, across distances, across uh, the electronic uh, divide uh, is critical. The other skills uh, would, be, uh, would be empathy and understanding. These are soft skills that, uh, that in hard subjects you can't pick up. How do you teach MOE... that? How do you teach that? <laughs> well, certainly, uh, uh, values in action uh, has been MOE's approach to ensuring that our children not only pick up hard knowledge, but also be able to pick up these softer skills of empathy, understanding, compassion, and the whole emotional quotient or EQ in being able to relate to people, people like them and people who are different from them. And so our teachers are not just uh, teaching by, by co communicating with the children, but also through their actions and their behaviour. And in a way, both parents and people in the community become role models and teachers, whether we like it or not. And so that's a very important uh, skill that, uh, that our young will, will, will need to have. The third skill is to be able to, uh, to switch and to pivot and to tilt. Let me explain. Um, in recent times, you see job roles that never existed before. Uh, let me give you an example in, say, the uh, built environment sector. Uh, just rewind back, say, 10 years, maybe you don't even need 10 years, five years ago, and you want to build uh, any of these buildings in Singapore, uh, it would be two-dimensional drawings. Right? And so you, you can be trained in architecture or engineering or construction, and for decades and decades and decades, or for generations, you, you, you do 2D drawings and you then pass it on to people down the construction value chain to build and it's brick and mortar industry. But uh, what has accelerated over the last few years has been the value proposition of digitization. Right? So gone almost overnight are the skills needed to do physical two-dimensional drawings. But uh, then if our children are in that role, they must be able to pivot to do three-dimensional building information models which totally transform the way in which the whole sector and the whole value chain collaborate with each other. So suddenly you have new jobs like BIM modelers, building information modelers. And so our, our children, when they grow up, must never expect that with the skills they pick up in school and university, a polytechnic or ITE, will stand them in good stead all through life because the disruption that technology will have on jobs and on assured skill sets will accelerate. And so right. our children will need to be able to pivot and switch using a, a broad set of skills, including soft skills, to be able to perform these newfangled roles that may just arrive at your doorstep overnight. No wonder people say it's not easy to be a child these days. No, <laughs> not indeed. <laughs> and we have three. Yeah. Okay. You too. Yes. Oh, actually. Okay, I want to talk about uh, the government's support uh, for Singaporeans who have been hit by COVID-19. The government has got various schemes uh, to help uh, those who have been hit during this period. This is expected to be a protracted uh, situation. Is the government prepared to support more and for longer? Yes. The pandemic uh, is not just a public health threat, it has a long tail in terms of the economic impact it will have. And its impact on lower income Singaporeans and on vulnerable households uh, will be magnified because people from uh, low income households may have less savings, uh, they may have a sole breadwinner, uh, they may have uh, less resources and less connections that will enable them to uh, sail through uh, choppy waters uh, and therefore we are extremely concerned about the impact on low-income households. Uh, but broader than that, you see the uh, uh, pandemic affecting even households that all this while have been 
fairly stable and have been able to manage all this while. Uh, say, husband and wife, uh, both PMETs, because of the sector they're in being severely impacted, uh, they may suddenly find that uh, they've lost all their income. And so our support during this pandemic, uh, both for the here and now and possibly for the longer term, must address both the needs of the vulnerable for whom the challenges will be magnified and exacerbated, but also the impact on the broader segment of Singaporeans who, until now, uh, have been able to be self-reliant, but who will need a lot more support both directly to them as well as indirectly through their employers in order to keep uh, their jobs. Let me give an example. Almost 600,000 people applied for the Temporary Relief Fund. That's a big group of people. How, for how long can we sustain prolonged support for what seems to be a growing group of people? Yes, the uh, economic fallout from the pandemic uh, has been severe and it will be protracted. The Temporary Relief Fund had uh, 450,000 people uh, who received that support. Uh, and that is really a reflection of the economic distress to people and to jobs. Uh, following the Temporary Relief Fund, we have the COVID-19 Support Grant, which supports employees who have lost their jobs or, or have lost income, uh, as well as the Self-Employed Income Relief Scheme, or SERS, which supports uh, self-employed persons who, during a situation like this, are likely to be severely impacted as well. So both supporting employees as well as self-employed persons and enabling them during this period to have some financial support. But ultimately, these buttress the main strategy which the government is pushing on, which is helping people to keep jobs and helping people to find jobs. And uh, uh, the job support scheme, which over four budgets now totals more than $23.5 billion, right, uh, helped to enable employers uh, to keep local workers uh, by supporting the wages that they have to pay to their workers uh, at this depressed time. Uh, and to enable these employers to use government grants to train their workers in the meantime. Now this is taken up from the playbook of the global economic crisis. Uh, help employers keep Singaporean workers at their jobs. And that is actually the most important priority. And for those who have been uh, impacted and have lost their jobs, and in the first quarter of this year, some 3,200 people have lost their jobs through retrenchment, uh, largely as a result of the crisis, as well as young Singaporeans graduating from school, ITE, Poly, University, uh, for whom the economic outlook has turned dark overnight. Uh, the National uh, Job Council's commitment uh, is to work with the public and private sector to create 100,000 jobs as well as traineeship positions in order to give people that sense of dignity through work and the sense that, well, it's a crisis, it's hard to get a job, but I have a traineeship position where I pick up useful skills. Even as you pay me to, to pick up those skills or to pay me to undergo training, I am strengthening my skill set so that when, uh, when the sun rises again, when the clouds disappear, uh, and when jobs and opportunities return uh, to Singapore and, and hopefully the rest of the world, that we'll be able to then transition to those jobs. We have had to dip into reserves. Significantly. Yes. Um, some people may be worried. With prolonged support, will that mean that we need to dip into reserves again? Yes. Uh, the, reserves, uh, the reserves have enabled us during this very uncertain time uh, and the duration of which you know, is, is uncertain, to provide support to people to stay at work and for those who have lost their jobs to be supported uh, in the short term, mid term and if necessary in the longer term. But we need to make sure that we keep the spirit of Singapore together. A sense that, well, I need help but I'd rather get help to get a job or get help to pick up skills so that I can support my family. Certainly, we need to provide financial assistance, but actually, if you speak to many people, they would prefer if you, you give them the, the ability to earn a living to support their families. And that is the way, by dipping into our reserves, to enable jobs to be preserved and for us to position Singaporean workers for the upturn.
how do we balance between welfareism, if you like, and helping Singaporeans get through these extraordinarily difficult times? Yes, we certainly must incentivize people uh, to, to work. And uh, if you look at the COVID-19 support grant, it's financial assistance over three months, but it comes with job assistance as well as training opportunities. So in a way it is, if you like to call it welfare, but it's financial assistance, but it also comes with a gateway to picking up a job or picking up skills again. So in a way, both jobs and financial support are interlinked. In fact, this has been the DNA of our social support system all this while. If you look at the Comcare assistance, short and medium term assistance, which has been around for quite some time, for low income households, uh, who have difficulty meeting their basic needs. Uh, they get financial assistance, they get help with their housing rental, they get help with their utilities, they get help with their health care. But tied into that is support for them to go back to work or pick up skill sets. MSF has tried very, very hard to streamline the processes for application for some of these relief funds. And yet at the same time, online chatter shows that you know some people were not able to get their uh, applications through and there were also reported cases of abuse. W what is your takeaway? Any lessons learned or personal takeaways from this episode? Yes, we want to give help and we want to give help quickly but uh, as, a, as a government, we are responsible and need to be good stewards of public resources. Uh, and that is a, a general principle. But at a time of s significant uncertainty, we have to be very good stewards of these scarce resources because we do not know how long this crisis will last. And so for the Temporary Relief Fund, we have made it as flexible as we can. Uh, not just requiring official documents, but my officers will look at uh, emails, look at WhatsApp messages, look at apps that uh, indicate how much earnings have been collected. And for those who have difficulty providing documents, a declaration will do. So on the one hand, we have made the scheme flexible and quick. But on the other hand, we fully expected that some people would want to exploit the opportunity. Uh, and, uh, and I think through that, uh, they have... Uh, delayed the support that people who genuinely needed it would get. And so we have to strike the right balance. In terms of implementation, what was one lesson that you have learned that you know you will keep with you the next time, hopefully not, uh, a situation like this comes along? Yes, so give uh, support to people who need it, but make sure that the processes we put in place, uh, like what we've done for Temporary Relief Fund and the COVID-19 support grant, uh, uh, impose as little burden as possible uh, on the person requiring help. Minister, we'll take a short break sure. now, but when we come back, I'd like to address the issue of inequality. Yep. Minister, I would like to talk about inequality. Uh, COVID-19, the economic fallout from COVID-19 has hit the low income much more than the rich. Uh, it's not just in Singapore, but also in the rest of the world. I remember that more than a year ago, you said that uh, you are looking for fresh perspectives as well as challenging assumptions about inequality. What assumption has been challenged over the course of this crisis? Well, the uh, social sector, uh, and both government agencies and social service agencies alike, uh, have seen our work in supporting uh, low-income and more vulnerable households as a very high-touch, high-feel work. And it's a lot of face-to-face uh, -face engagement, close-up, as I said, high-touch, high-feel. But during this pandemic, uh, both MSF as well as our partners in the social services have found uh, that uh, the inability to connect digitally has made it difficult uh, to support our clients and beneficiaries. And uh, our charities, whether they're providing counselling, psychological support, helping uh, deal with family violence and child abuse, have had to put in place digital connectivity uh, with their clients in order to continue to provide the support that they need. And uh, during the uh, uh, circuit breaker, those inequalities get exacerbated. 
many of these uh, households are under a lot of strain already, right? Coping with jobs, coping with stresses, uh, getting financial support, yes, and getting support from the social services, yes. Uh, but when you impose a circuit breaker and they have to stay home, uh, those stresses and strains can spill out into the open. Even if you can arm them with a smartphone or a laptop, uh, they still have to be able to learn the skills. What yes. is the solution? Yes, so it's one thing to arm uh, your client uh, or the household with digital tools. It's another for them to be able to make the call. So imagine if you're a, a vulnerable uh, housewife right, who's really struggling with children and the uh, relationship with husband may, 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 may be exacerbated because of the circuit breaker. Uh, and we arm you with the phone to call your social worker anytime you want. But in that kind of, of space and setting, of everyone's at home, how do you make that call and cry for help? So it's, uh, it's, it's not straightforward. It's does, not that straightforward. Mean, does that mean that these agencies need to get more creative about helping their clients? Absolutely. So a lot of upstream preventive work uh, helping our clients understand what they can do in order to uh, protect themselves and also how they can get the support that they need uh, in a time of crisis uh, will be areas that we collectively have to look into. Uh, the National Council of Social Services uh, has set up a Co Beyond COVID-19 task force. Uh, it brings together a diverse range of uh, stakeholders, both from the private sector also from the social service sector and the government to pick up the lessons that we collectively from the social services uh, need to learn uh, from this crisis. Uh, and we certainly need to invest a lot more in digital connectivity, in empowering uh, vulnerable households and individuals with the skill sets to be able to connect back with us uh, and to uh, enable them uh, to, to, to manage uh, in a crisis like this. So one example I'd give would be uh, uh, home-based learning. So many of these lower-income households get support from the school uh, or from IMD to enable their children to have the devices they need to, to undergo classes. But you have more than one child and they both have to undergo home-based learning online at the same time, then that poses a challenge. So the key to supporting vulnerable households overcome the exacerbation of inequality uh, is to integrate the support that we give. And so the uh, uh, existing networks and platforms that we already have to support the vulnerable have to up their game. I'll give you one example. Uh, we have Community Link, and these uh, uh, platforms bring together the government and uh, social sector to support people living in rental housing. And uh, we have met and conversed with families living in rental housing with young children to understand up close what are their fears and what are their aspirations and understand what their needs are and what their assets are. Uh, and uh, through Comlink, we've been able to bring together and weave together the support and the services to enable these families uh, to do better. You are known for someone who walks the ground. You're very in touch and you're very hands-on. Uh, in other words, you've seen a lot. Is there anything that still surprises you? Um, for the last uh, year and a half, I've been uh, walking in the community with many of our partners uh, who reach out to and befriend uh, homeless Singaporeans, people who are out on the streets. Um, and. I think you'll never ever stop being surprised because every time you encounter someone in, in the valley of, of, of a crisis, a personal crisis, uh, you'll be surprised by the complexity of the challenges they face and you'll also be surprised by the strength and resilience that they exhibit. And uh, it always causes you to uh, break out of stereotypes and assumptions. So last week, I joined the uh, Rover Scouts. These are adult, young adult scouts. And they're part of our peers network to reach out to and support the homeless people. And uh, we encountered a man who was sleeping under a set of umbrellas. And uh, he really needed a lot of help with housing because he had a major fallout with his family. Uh, he had to sleep uh, first in a rented apartment and then in a, 
uh, in, a, in a backpacker inn and now sleeping on the streets. Uh, but uh, what really shone through was his, 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 his stubborn self-reliance and refusal to seek help. But we hope that uh, in the weeks and months to come, that uh, we build a relationship of trust with him to enable him to accept shelter and support that will enable him to go on to the road to recovery. And so the lesson that we learn is never assume uh, things. That every person, no matter how deep their crisis, will have a unique story. And so the challenge of the social services is there can never be cookie-cutter solutions. There can never be an application of stereotypes. What I'm hearing is that these are not just numbers, they are not no, stats, not. but these are real people with stories. So we don't track just the number of people who are homeless that we're helping. And during the COVID-19 crisis, we have assisted 500 seek shelter. But we actually look at the individual circumstances that inhibit them from finding the most basic need, which is shelter. Inequality is going to be a big issue uh, post-COVID, not just for Singapore, but for the rest of the world. Uh, what is the one thing that we need to do now in order to, continuing, to continue narrowing the gap between the rich and the poor? The amount of effort that we need to put into tackling inequality will have to be greater and greater. Uh, we have broad-based schemes that support everyone in housing, education and healthcare. And on top of that, a layer of targeted support tilted in favour of the lower income. But I'd, I'd argue, and that is the work of the last few years, we need to go even deeper, even more micro, in deeper partnership with stakeholders and the social services, and in a deeper partnership with the families that are struggling to overcome inequalities. And the structures that we are putting in place for the last two years and accelerated by this crisis are communities of stakeholders and charities and departments who have to share information, have to work together and have to see the people we are helping uh, not as statistics but as people with real lives and real challenges who have assets and strengths that they can deploy to support themselves but who may need customised support from different organisations in tandem with each other to ensure that we unshackle them challenge after challenge in order for them uh, to overcome these inequalities. Let's take a short break now, but when we come back, I'd like to talk about the impact of looking at all this pandemic-related WhatsApp messages and Facebook posts. Minister, I'd like to talk about mental health. How do you think the circuit breaker and all the safe distancing measures, what kind of impact have they had on our mental health? Well, the uh, economic fallout has caused people to feel very stressed about uh, their jobs and about their future. Uh, the circuit breaker uh, has divided families, parent from child, grandparent from grandchild. Uh, it has put together uh, within the confines of four walls uh, family members whose relationships may have uh, been poor all this while and exacerbated by the proximity and the duration. And so we've seen uh, a, a steep rise in uh, uh, people seeking help uh, because they're anxious or they feel uh, uh, that they need support on, in terms of mental wellness. And so early on in this crisis, we set up the National Care Hotline. And today it is operated 24-7 by some 760 volunteers from the public, private and people sector. Uh, these are counsellors, psychologists, people trained in psychological first aid. And uh, they tell me that the night shift is the worst. People feel isolated, lonely, where they feel that they want to speak to someone and cry for help. And uh, since uh, we started, we've uh, handled some uh, close to 20,000 calls, uh, just under half of which uh, required support from our care officers uh, because it involves anxiety, depression, mental health challenges. Um, and these come from uh, both young and old. And uh, two groups are particularly uh, of concern. One would be seniors and the other would be young people. For seniors, uh, the circuit breaker has caused uh, some of them to be isolated. And loneliness can set in and then they start to imagine the worst. Uh, cut off from their families, cut off from the community uh, because of public health reasons, uh, they, they are at high risk. And how did we address that? We had uh, people call up to 20,000 seniors above the age of 65 who live alone. Call them and just be a listening ear. 
find out what they need, engage them, allow them to, to pour out their emotions and quickly follow up if they need urgent support. Now for young people, that's another group who have never been through a crisis of such proportions and for whom the future had always been bright. And because of this overnight uh, turnaround, because of the crisis, they feel under a lot of stress and strains. And young people are uh, almost eternally connected to social media and imagine receiving news after news of, of uh, very sad news from around the world uh, can cause a strain on their emotions and not being able to meet their friends and do the things that they do. And uh, we have a youth mental well-being network. We started in uh, late January. We had a call for action and more than a thousand people responded. Caregivers, recovered patients, uh, professionals, as well as social service agencies who want to play a part in providing better support, especially in the community, uh, for young people uh, who need mental uh, health support. And in fact, uh, just over the weekend, I met uh, the leaders of this network uh, to see how we can galvanise this uh, thousand-strong team of volunteers to provide better community support for young people uh, at this point in time and leave as a legacy of this crisis a stronger community-based uh, network of support for young people in terms of mental health. Do you think people are underestimating the impact of the pandemic on our mental health? Um, certainly, people tend to brush it off. That, uh, because they're so preoccupied with the uh, concerns over health, you know, physical health because of the virus, as well as over their jobs and their future and their studies. Uh, and it's easy for people to brush off until it gets much worse, the impact of the uh, pandemic on their emotional well-being. Uh, because it has, it's a very corrosive effect. So here we are worried about catching the virus, but actually the anxiety and the stress has a corrosive effect on our mental health. Yes, and it's very easy for people to brush off the signs and symptoms uh, of anxiety, uh, depression uh, and mental health challenges uh, because people are very concerned about uh, the virus and very concerned about their livelihoods and their families but uh, when you start uh, losing sleep uh, uh, being disinterested in people and things around you or losing appetite and all these are signs and symptoms and so public education is key for people to recognize uh, that uh, their resilience is being put to the test uh, and to know where to seek help and recognise that stigma should not stand in the way, that we should overcome stigma and fear. Uh, the National Care Hotline is there. Our partners stand ready to support anyone who faces mental health challenges as a result of the pandemic. Uh, but we need people to be able to recognise that they need help and to speak to someone early so that we can support them. The road ahead will be very challenging. And uh, it's not just a public health and economic challenge but uh, a, a real test of our individual and collective resilience and being able to, to maintain our spirit in our constitution, ensuring that we are, uh, our mental wellness, we are on top of it, uh, is very critical for us to be able to emerge stronger. To emerge stronger from the pandemic, why is mental health important? To be able to cope with the very dynamic and fluid situation. Every day there's a new development. Every day there's a new requirement. Every day there's a new phasing in of something or the other. Uh, having to make adjustments in all aspects of your life, in family interactions, in our social interactions, how we dine in and take away, how we go to work and travel uh, to work and back, uh, how we interact at the office, how do, how do we interact in school. Our social and, 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 and mental resilience will be put to the test because every one of us, like it or not, uh, has to adapt rapidly. And if we don't uh, pay attention to mental health, individually and collectively, then it will be very hard for us to adjust and to be able to emerge stronger. How has the pandemic changed you as a leader? During this pandemic, we are forced to make some very difficult decisions trade-offs for which there is no ideal situation or solution. I'll give you one example. Uh, if you look at around the world, uh, nursing homes, the casualties of COVID-19 in nursing homes is catastrophic. 
you look at uh, the US, you look at Europe, um, nursing homes get overrun by COVID. And so we've had to make, uh, during the circuit breaker, some very, very difficult decisions. And we're very blessed because our partners understand the very difficult trade-offs we have to make. And uh, to keep the seniors in the nursing homes and the welfare homes safe, we had to make a very big ask uh, of the care staff. We had asked them to stay in or stay at accommodation we specially arranged for them, but be cut off from their families for over a month in order to create a protective bubble around them and the seniors they protect. And so between protecting lives and livelihoods, between supporting the seniors and taking care of the well-being of our caregivers who work in these professional settings, uh, was one difficult trade-off we had to make. And thankfully, we had very understanding partners who knew what that singular mission was of saving lives. And that enabled us to, to execute those decisions uh, effectively and achieve the outcome that we, we, we sought to achieve. Thank you very much, Minister, for your time. Thank you.